starting a new study and the you know part one of it is going to be how we got the Bible and I want to um, I feel like I don't have enough room right here because I want to take down some some things from y'all but I will I will make all this work um, so I have a little bit of an idea of how um, how this will work and I want to um, uh, just just put this out out there to y'all. I want to have this kind of introductory class be um, more of a discussion. Let's talk about this concept and see where you want it to go and, and make sure that we're heading in the right direction. We're talking about the right things um, that are going to be more applicable to you. And then what I'd like to do as we go on is have um, a little bit of a rotation um, where a different person, not necessarily teach the entire class, but like we um, rotate through a few people who are willing to introduce the class topic, you know, do our board and prayer, and then um, a couple of, I'll get with you and you know, a couple of verses or a couple of concepts or a uh, discussion question or two, and just kind of lead that little bit of it um, before we get into new stuff as a way of, of introducing the topic for the week and reviewing the topic from last week and just kind of, you know, round robin um, do that so that way everybody gets a little bit of a chance to um, to, to do it and get some experience and opening up and at least leading part of the class and stuff. Um, so uh, we, we've kind of, we, we put our study, uh, we ended James and First Peter and so now um, we're going to go into this study and uh, uh, let's start off, I, I'd like to just start off by reading this. So there's a book um, from God to Us, How We Got Our Bible, Norma Geisler and William Nix. Uh, there is this is kind of an this is like an abbreviated copy of what they have uh, called their general introduction to the Bible, and so that is you know about that thick or so, and it's a big hard hard cover book you know that goes deep into detail on all this stuff, and this goes into just about as much detail as you could really want, but um, but it it's kind of the abridged version of it you know, and it's also a little bit easier to go okay. Uh, I'm going to skip that one, <laughs> you know, if, if you want to. So um, I like this book. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to agree totally with Geisler and Nix on on everything, but their um, talking, of their their discussion of um, how we got our Bible today in present form. So I mean, how how much do we think about, you know, the Bible in the form that we have it today? Uh, what are some things that come to mind when we just think about the concept of the Bible? How long a lot of it's been around? Mm -hmm. It's been around for a, a very, very long time, right? Um, uh, we don't know precisely when the first book of the Bible was written. A lot of people think Job is probably the first book, and there's no dates in there, and there's no, um, there's really no uh, markers in terms of, of um, you know, this person was king, right? For us to kind of hang our hat on and be like, this is where it starts. So a lot of people think that Job is is possibly the first book of the Bible to actually be written. Now, obviously, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the first action, right? But um, as far as putting pen to paper, we know that's Moses. Much farther along, Moses is writing these things um, that have been passed down and, and as they're inspired from God. So putting pen to paper is what I'm talking about here. <coughs> so um, people are going to say, you're, you're thinking about like, 1500 years before Christ whereabouts you know at least is where you're going to be starting if not farther back than that so that puts us about 3500 years from today you know 3500 years ago is when they started writing the Bible started putting pen to paper that's that's kind of crazy to think about you know how long a memory was it before then? You know? How long was it passed down as you know yeah. oral tradition? Yeah. yeah. Um, Before anybody said, okay, well, somebody needs to read about this thirty five hundred years from now. Yeah. Uh, you you know? know, oral tradition is is such a major part, um, <clears throat> and it and we don't catch it as much because we're reading an English translation of it. You know, it's not quite as as particular. You know, because something's always lost a little bit in translation. Not the concept, not the, the truth of it, or anything like that, but just um, maybe something in the tone sometimes is lost, you know? Um, but you have uh, um, the, before 
you have a written copy of something, you do have this oral tradition. And it's not like telephone tag. It's not like the game of telephone tag we play where I'm going to whisper something in Tyler's ear and then see what Martha says at the end, right? You know? It's not like that at all. It's like, let's memorize this. And then they would go through memorizing these things. And then it's like, okay, read, tell, tell it back to me. No, 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 no. Hold on a second. This is what happened, you know? And so there, there'd be, you know, I mean, um, uh, you know, military world, they call it a back brief, right? <clears throat> Where you're going to tell somebody something and say, what did I say to make sure that I explained it to you properly and make sure that you heard it properly, right? There's a lot of that going on. So these, um, these historical accounts, so many of them before they're put you know, pen to paper or, or chisel to stone or however it is they're actually writing and we'll get into all that later. But um, for right now, I'll just say pen to paper and you know, uh, you'll see what I mean. But um, before that happens, you have people who are faithfully handing down these historical events, right? And you're trying to pass this along. Um, now you get an added aspect of the Bible having the inspiration of God. And that's where we're going to start for the first few weeks is talking just about the concept of inspiration and how, um, how that worked. How, what do we mean when we say the Bible is the inspired word of God? That's where we're really going to, to start next week. Um, well, this week and next week. But you have um, these stories that are passed down and people are very, very, very faithfully handing them down. And we see this, um, you get to the time of, of Jesus, right? Um, it's a really good example because we have so many um, people writing at this time. So we have all these different perspectives we can see from the ancient world at this time. And so, I mean, by the, by the time a Jewish boy was 15, he would be expected to have memorized word for word the Pentateuch. I mean, imagine that. Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Josh. Five books, right? Yeah, yeah Le Leviticus numbers, right? Um, in no particular order, <laughs> I don't know why I went there, but um, uh, but so you have you have the first five books of the Old Testament, and th those are just memorized. I mean, word for word. If somebody was going to try to be taken on by a rabbi, and typically a rabbi would take at it at any given time, ten uh, pupils, ten students that were directly under him, right? Um, they might ask things that that are like, how many times is the name of the Lord? said in Isaiah and you would need to know it right there um, the uh, tradition later on in, in Judaism when they were faithfully uh, transcribing the words of the Old Testament and passing them on um, the people who would transcribe these things uh, would be expected to know what the middle uh, verse of every book was the middle word of every book was, and they would need to know all these things. And they would also need to know how it looked on paper. It, they essentially wanted them to photocopy these things. They didn't want them to be like, okay, well, my handwriting's a little bigger or a little smaller. No, no, no. It needs to be the exact same size. They had such, they're called the um, uh, Masoretes. They had such a respect for the, for the Bible that they actually had a rule that said, even if a king approaches you, to interrupt your writing, you are not to stop writing or interrupt, even if a king walks up and commands you to, until you are done with that word. There's supposed to be such focus on the text, you know, on the Bible, making sure that it is faithfully handed down. And so we have some of these texts that are, you know, a thousand years older. When it comes to the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find these ancient texts like of Isaiah, that are a thousand years older than anything we had previously. And there are like three words that are different. And, and I think I think they're all, and I can't remember, don't quote me on this, but they're like using the article, the word the, right, or not, which is very fluid in a lot of the ancient writings, whether you have a definite article, whether it's the, or you just say like, you know, the God or God, right? It won't make a difference in our translation because we'll take out the anyway, you know, in a lot of situations. But so you have these these things for 100 percent. There's no doctrine change, no concept change, no anything like that for a thousand years. Right. So these things are not being changed over time. And we have such good evidence that they're, they're just not being changed over time. So when we think about how old the Bible is, um, it's incredible. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just incredible 
to consider the amount of history that it contains. Just, I mean, just from a historical perspective. And a lot of people like to throw out the Bible in terms of history, right? Um, there is a you know an anti supernatural bias, right? Well, the Bible says there are miracles, so that means we, we know there's no miracles, so it can't be, right? Well, that that's a that's a big assumption, right? If you're going to throw out anything that talks about any kind of miracles, um, number one, the Bible is the only one that gets that treatment. Let's just be honest, because a lot of other ancient writings will talk about things happening, and, and they go, well, that's supernatural, but the rest of it's true, you know. So they just embellished here, or whatever. So the Bible is the only one you have that, even with a, you know, anti-supernatural bias. Um, but you have, you really do have a. Um, you have so much in terms of world history that is going to be contained within the Bible. I mean, um, 66 books written over the course of, you know, 1,500, 1,600 years or so, because you're going to get into the end of the first century is really when the end of, of the entire Bible we have, you know, is written. Um, about 430 uh, B.C. Is, is when the end of the Old Testament occurs, and then you're going to get the New Testament, which is going to be closed out by 95, 96 A.D., um, and so, the 1600 years right here, how much happens in the world during this time? I mean, just think about, think about Daniel, right? Daniel gets called in to interpret a dream about um, the, the giant statue. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head, you know, it's got a different head, different body, different legs, and then different feet, you know, four different kinds. There's going to be four different kingdoms here. and. I mean, over the course of world history, I mean, I know nobody ever figures out air conditioning or anything like that. You don't have technology advancing like it does within the last hundred years or something, but just so much happens. And so when we look at the Bible, we should be able to look at it and say, um, all right, what, what is going on in the world at this time? And it's just one of the best books from a historical perspective just because of the fact of how old it is, right? What else when we just think about the Bible? In fact, you can cross-reference those historical markers with secular texts mm -hmm. throughout the Old and the New Testament. I mean, that's you can pinpoint in other texts that are historical, not religiously noted. I mean, it's really neat to be able to cross-reference all that. Right. That's right. a good litmus test. Exactly. You know, um, Luke has, oh, I forget the number off the top of my head, but, you know, he lists some 50-odd or so. Um, it's somewhere in that ballpark. Um, different places, people, uh, positions is a big one, um, especially because you get into the book of Acts, and Acts 16 and 17, he mentions two different kinds of governmental positions that people for centuries said did not exist. Just didn't exist. That didn't happen, right? Um, but now we found archaeological evidence. It's like, oh, it did exist. And these people, actually named by uh, Luke, were here at this time in this office. Right, um, so you get you the Persian kings in the Old Testament that are that are, you know, that are that are marked in time, and, and you have writers in the Old Testament referencing that in the text. Yeah, especially when you get somebody who's written um, 150 years prior to somebody and names them. Yeah, you know, wasn't it the uh, the Hittites? I think. Yeah, the the, the, the people were like. That civilization never existed. Israel fought with people that didn't exist. The Bible's wrong. Yeah. And then just within the past 10 years, they found another group of people in that area of the country, and they're like, we have no idea who this is. And then it's like, it pops up. It's like property of Hittites. You know, it's yeah. something along those lines. They're like, huh, that's weird. I think it's longer than 10 years now. It's, but, it, um, but I remember it being recent. But it's pretty you know, recent. It's, it's, it's pretty recent. It's, it's not um, too far, but... And, uh, and yeah, and they were, uh, it was, what happened was a giant sandstorm came yeah. through and, and leveled like, it and off, and then stuff. they got the tops of these buildings, and essentially it was buried for, you know, like 3,000 years under 16 feet of sand. And the Israelites utterly destroyed the Hittites, right? They really did utterly just, I mean, it was completely desolate, and it just got covered with sand. That was, that's what happened, you know? And so they they were blotted out from existence, essentially, you know. And so um, so when the Bible says something, um, we need to be careful and not to have a. Um, in science, a lot of people refer to it as God of the gaps theory, right? That that well, we don't have evidence as to how this happened yet, so you're just going to say God did it, 
you know, and, and that's it, right? Uh, we need to be careful not to follow that fallacy, but um, what happens a lot of times is people come to the other extreme and they're like, well, we don't have any evidence of the Hittites. There's no evidence for it, so that means it is wrong. Well, now you're assuming, you know, now you're assuming that it must be wrong rather than we don't have any evidence and I can't say one way or the other, you know. We don't, by the way, that's one of those things that you need to look at. When somebody is trying to bring in evidence to disprove the Bible, would they treat another text the same way? Would they treat another ancient text the same way? And almost always the answer is no. Because if we were, then we would, we would completely throw away so many other ancient texts that give us all this information. You know, you've got to throw away all of this human history because if you're going to apply the same test to the Bible, well, we don't have a record of these people here, so you've got to be wrong. You must be wrong and let's just throw you out. Well, Okay, maybe they're using a different name for the for these people. Maybe these people did exist just over here, and we, you know, I mean, it's been three thousand years. Maybe those buildings are gone or built on top of. You know, like it's possible. <laughs> you know, um, and so uh, and so that's one of those things. Do do the people who are trying to disprove it do the same thing with other historical documents? Let me read. Um, I'm going to read this from How We Got the Bible. This is actually at the end. Um, of his whole discussion, um, and uh, but I'd like to start off with the end here, and then kind of the beginning in this for God to us. Um, so chapter eighteen, he starts off with my words. My words will not pass away. He says tracing the Bible down through the centuries presents the human side of how we got the Bible. And that's one of the things we are going to be looking at from a different standpoint. The story of how we got the Bible begins and ends with God. God is light and the source of light, both physical and spiritual. Ultimately, then the question of how we got the Bible leads us to the throne of God. In Mark 13, 31, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, and my words will not pass away. Here Jesus makes two claims. First, he claims that his words are divine. The world will not pass away. Excuse me, the world will pass away, but his words will not. Therefore, his words are not from this world. Second, because his words are divine, Jesus claims that his words will stand forever. What do you think about that? So far, he's done a pretty good job. <laughs> I mean, you know, two thousand years later, we still have, a, you know, pretty spot on what he said. Yeah. Um, Mark is is likely, almost certainly, in my opinion, uh, the first gospel written. Right. Right. That where um, I mean, obviously, Jesus did this, and you have four different gospels, and they all, the events occurred all at the same time. But when somebody actually put, you know, read to papyrus and put it on 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 this, so we can have this recorded. Mark is probably the first, writing less than 20 years after Jesus, right? Um, and so that's very close, and he's kind of been proven to be right, right? <laughs> you know? Um, is he wrong? Have, have Jesus' words passed away? They clearly have not, right? You know, whether, whether you believe them or not is a secondary question, you know? But have the words passed away? No. You know, so many things have come and gone over the course of the past 2,000 years, right? But, you know, we still have the Bible and we still study it today. We still look at it for guidance, you know? That's one of the strongest, you know, proofs for the Bible is how well it really has stood the test of time, you know? I mean, you look at other documents, whether they be well written, you know, or not. I mean, our Constitution was incredibly well written. There's going to come a point where it's going to go away. Right, it is not close to where it was before. You know, I mean, it's going to go away. It's just going to happen at some point. You know, all nations fall and change hands and adjust. You know, I mean, the British monarchy was there forever, right? I mean, they're still there, but they're not. You know, I mean, it's fundamentally different than it was, right? I mean, that's just the way that the world works. Everything is going to change. Change is constant, but the Bible has not changed. And, you know, I mean, the words of it have not changed over the course of 2,000 years. That's like the Ten Commandments been taken out of courtrooms. What's that? That's like the Ten Commandments been taken out of courtrooms. You know, oh, with our nation? They're not in there no more. Yeah. They're not. I mean, things are, things are going to change. Things you know? change, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to our country, but that doesn't mean that God did not deliver the Ten Commandments. Right, you know? yeah. I mean, I it doesn't change the truth of 
of what they have. Right. I mean, we can we can change our perspective. We can change how things are going, but the words most certainly have not passed away, even as much as people would want them to. You know, especially since there were so many nations that tried to wipe out the Bible by burning all of the copies. Mm-hmm. And yeah, was, I mean, and now today it's like the number one. <laughs> I mean, just within. I mean, beginning of last century. Think about when Marxism uh, kind of took hold, and then especially with um, you know uh, communist Russia and stuff. I mean, just huge burning of Bibles and expelling all Christians from church buildings and turning those into different kinds of buildings and stuff like that. You know, and um, uh, I mean that that occurred a hundred years ago, right? And did it hold? No. <laughs> you know, I mean, everyone who has tried to destroy the, the Bible have failed, and they've gone away. They passed away, but once again, the words have continued. That's a pretty, that's a pretty significant, um, you know, prophecy, if you will, right there, and that we're still looking at this two thousand years later. Turn over to Second um, Timothy chapter three. If I get somebody to read Second Timothy three sixteen. Um, through 17 and then if I could get somebody else to read 2 Peter 1 verses 19 through 21 who has, uh, who has uh, 2 Timothy all scripture is breathed out of God and is profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work so the word scripture occurs 51 times in the New Testament and at least 50 of those times, uh, it is referring basically to the Old Testament, right? Um, that, was, that was the idea of Scripture that they had back then. I mean, remember, these are letters that we have that are being written to specific congregations and to specific people um, about what's going on at the time and everything. Um, but what's really interesting is what we get in Second Peter. I know we didn't go through and study Second Peter here, but Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. If somebody could read those, those verses. We also have the the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to light shining in the darkness, darkest place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy or scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had itself origin in the human will, and prophets through humans spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Who has another um, way of saying the last part about the Holy Spirit? Other translations, and they read differently. The holy men of God spoke, and they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They're moved by the Holy Spirit. Carried along by the Holy Spirit. Carried along, yeah. So the um, Jesus says heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away and Paul when he's writing to Timothy tells him all scripture you know uh, probably mostly referring to the Old Testament but at this time there's already coming the idea of these New Testament writings right um, is given by God and it's proper, profitable for all these things, right? And then in uh, Second Peter, you have people are not writing. I mean, essentially what um, Peter is saying in here is that people are not writing whatever they feel like. You know? They are writing, these prophets are writing what they have been um, propelled by, carried by, moved by the Holy Spirit to proclaim to you. Right? It's not something that is, is their own. Now... Um, when we get farther along, we're going to see there's kind of a test for this, right? You know? Now, in the Old Testament, the test is if a prophet says something and it um, comes true, you'll take his word because he has been proven to be a, tro- a prophet. If a prophet says something and it does not come true, then you are to ignore him because he is not from God. He is speaking of his own will, and prophets are not supposed to speak of their own will, right? Only speak what God has given you to speak. Rather, rather simply. And so Peter is making the case here um, that the Holy Spirit is the one guiding these things. Um, God is guiding their words right here. So that's a, a big claim. But when he's referring to prophets, he's also going to refer to, the, I mean, these people are going to have this in the back of their mind. Prophets 
that say things that are not true are not actually prophets. So there is a high, a high bar in their minds that these New Testament writers have to pass. It's not like we were like, well, these books look good. Let's throw them in there, you know? This, this is nice teaching. Well, let's just, let's just throw this one in there. This one, this one sounds cool. This one says God is love in it. That's pretty, you know? No, 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 no. It's not like that. You have people who have been proven to be accurate in what they're saying is going to occur, all right? And, um, and so that's how we can, we can trust these things. Well, where do the names of the books come from? Um, well, some of them are uh, the names of the authors, and some of them are the names of the people who they are writing to. So um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, and we're we'll just taking the New Testament, those are um, the individuals who wrote them. You know, Acts, the longer name is Acts of the Apostles, right? It is a historical book, but we know it's written by Luke. He says that at the very beginning, right? Uh, it's written by Luke. It's kind of a part two to his gospel. You know, okay, this is what happened until, until the death of Jesus. This is what happened after the death of Jesus and the birth of the church. And then you get, you know, um, Romans through uh, what, 2 Thessalonians is going to be um, the titles of church, yeah, the names of churches that they're writing to. And then... Um, uh, first, second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, those are the individuals that it's being written to. So they're not churches, they're individuals that are located at different congregations. Um, and then you have, um, what is it? Uh, yeah, well, Hebrews is uh, to the Jewish people, right? James is the author, first, second Peter, authors, uh, you know, Peter is the author of those, first, second, third John. John, the same one who wrote the Gospel of John, but these are um, the longer titles are called, you know, the first, John, the second, John third Jr. epistle. John. No, it's not. Yeah, 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 it's not. It's not a whole <laughs> bunch of different people. Third. And John also wrote Revelation, but the idea, the Revelation, um, or um, as some older translations uh, have it, the Apocalypse, right, which is the uh, revealing, the unveiling. I mean, it sounds like, you know, we're like Apocalypse. Wow, you know, that's crazy. You know, um, no, it just means. It just means the, the revealing of something. And so we're like, well, we'll call it revelation, right? Because that's more of an English word, you know. So, um, and so you have, uh, you have that. And so it's God revealing something to John. And John is passing this back to the churches in the area of Asia Minor. So that's, that's where the titles go. Who was the one that first initially started putting Jesus' words in? Well, that's a good question. I think you have... Because now we got it in, you know, Jesus' uh, words in red, you know. Uh, oh, well, whatever, so the four know. Gospels, the four Gospels you're going to have, and we're going to kind of go through through all this a little bit later, but the four Gospels you have, um, so Matthew was a apostle of Jesus. Matthew was with Jesus every day for his three-year earthly ministry, so he knew what Jesus said, right? Uh, Mark was the uh, protege of Peter, who was obviously Jesus' apostle and in his inner circle. So a lot of these stories come from Peter, which is interesting because Peter is um, is kind of um, numerically at least the most harsh, harshly treated in um, harshly treated. Uh, Peter does kind of the dumbest stuff in Mark. It's interesting. So you don't really have. It seems that Peter was not trying to gloss over anything. It's that it probably seemed more blaring in his mind than necessarily to the other writers, you know. So uh, Luke uh, was um, associated very heavily with Paul, and so he was also, he's a doctor, he's a historian. So he's writing much more from a historical perspective, and he says in the beginning of Luke, I am going to put together an orderly account from the sources. So he says, I'm going to, I've, I've interviewed people essentially, I've talked to people, I want to give you a very orderly account of what happened. I want it to be clear and, and direct, straightforward what happened when Jesus was on the earth. So, um, you know, and that's because of his influence and being for several years on the mission field with Paul. Uh, and then John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was a close disciple with Jesus and um, and so was, was there. And um, so you get very close connections to Jesus. So that's, those are the people who wrote the four Gospels. And so, um, you know, these people are basically writing from memory or from sources of people who were, who were there, you know. And uh, a lot of people will bring up, we'll get to this later, but a lot of people bring up, it's like, well, why did it take so long for these things to be written down? You know, um, and, I, and that's one of those things, but if we were to, say, 
if somebody was going to write a historical account of 9-11, would it be possible for somebody to make up something about it? Really? I mean, would it be possible for somebody to just completely, completely change everything that happened and, you know, for example, claim that the Twin Towers are still standing? Yeah. Not right now. I mean, they, they, they could, they could uh, write it. They could, they could, they could write, write it, write but it. would anybody believe it? No. 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 We'd be like, um, no. They're, that's not, I mean, we have a completely different building there now. You know? Uh, you know, write it and be like, well, you know, this didn't occur, or, or whatever, or try to embellish the entire story and, and make up something completely different that happened. You know, it was an alien attack or something, right? You couldn't, you couldn't get away with it, right? Because people would be like, no. You'd have you could have legitimately thousands of people, and there are thousands of people who saw Jesus, right? You'd have people be like, "I was there, I saw this happen, I saw what occurred," right? And all these other people around would know about it, even you know we weren't there, but we would know about it, right? And it, it'd just be one of those things where you look at it and you're like, "Well, I'm just going to throw this out," right? I, mean, I got some people that say, "I wasn't there, I never seen them." You might have some people, but the majority of people and reasonable people, I mean, it's not going to get passed along for 2,000 I years. I was. Yeah. You know, it's not going to get passed along for 2,000 years right. with people saying, this is accurate, this is accurate, this is accurate. Right. They're going to be like, no, this is crazy. And, Maybe and throw it out. I've never seen them. You know, I, I know that it happened. I yeah. know where I was whenever they come over to the radio and said, you know, this is devastation. Uh, I remember to this day where I was, what I was doing. You know, so yes, I know it happened, but you know, I never seen the twin towers. I never, you know, other than in pictures and stuff. So that, that's that's something you gotta look at too. You know, uh, nobody in here is is young anymore. Sorry, we're getting older every day. Uh, but the younger crowd, you know, the little children that are running around here, other than just seeing uh, what we tell them and what's written down, they don't know. They never seen it, you know. So it'd be easier for somebody to say, "Okay, this didn't happen to them," than to us. True, but I mean, for for people who didn't see it happen, though, they rely on the people who were there to have struck down any false accounts. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, if there's if there's one person who comes out and says this happened, or you know, as we have the Gospels, four people came out and said this happened, but then you have legitimately thousands of other people who are like, "No, it didn't." No, it didn't. No, it didn't. You Same know? thing with the Holocaust. I mean, right. Are, there, there are people important. who completely deny that the Holocaust ever occurred, but there's so much evidence, and it's like, well, okay, I'm going to say that this never happened. Some, you know, some of these people out there, but we go, okay, that's fringe. That's crazy. That's not, you know, that's not reasonable thought to have. Well, the same comes with the Bible. You know, is that we either have to assume that the majority of the of society and civilization at this time, you know. Um, was having a shared delusion, decided to fool people for continuation of time, or that these events actually occurred, as as they said they were to occur, right? Uh, Guys, our next put it this way: at the very beginning of their book, says the Bible is a unique book, is one of the oldest books in the world, and yet it is still the world's bestseller. It is a product of the ancient. Uh, Eastern world, but it has molded the modern Western world. Tyrants have burned the Bible, and builders, excuse me, believers revere it. It is the most quoted, most published, most translated, and most influential book of the history of mankind. What do y'all think about that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's a big claim. It, it's not. It's not insignificant of a claim. Um, and so, because of that, we do need to be willing to look at it. And, and, and take a look and say, um, okay, does it really meet that standard, right? Um, it, it's, it's one of those things where we go, okay, well, um, it, it's very easy for us to just accept it and say, okay, well, yeah, sure, I, I believe the Bible and everything, right? Um, but for somebody who, you know, I, I mean, you know, for me, example, I grew up going to church and everything like that, so I... I I believe the Bible, but for somebody who doesn't have that background, right? Um, you give them that claim right there, that claim right there. They'd be like, "Well, okay, I know the Bible's been, 
influential on Western civilization, sure, but like the most important book ever written, you know, and and like what, you know, should it be revered? Uh, you're not going to get somebody who's just ready and willing to accept it completely. So we need to be able to put together a case and say, here is the reasons why you should believe the Bible. You know, let me, let me put all these together and say, this is basically the reason that you need to believe the Bible. And if the Bible, the Bible is what it claims to be, and we just read the inspired word of God, it is scripture, it is the Holy Spirit moving men to you know, put pen to paper here. It's not the words of, of men. It is the word of God. Then, from understanding, from, from a point where we can say, yes, that is true. Then, what the Bible says needs to be followed. We have to obey what it says, right? Because if it is that book, right? then we need to, I mean, that should cause a change in us, right? We can't just say, yeah, sure, I agree with that, but I'm going to do my own thing, right? Make, makes no sense, right? And there is going to be some of the, word for, um, you know, that's, that's where the rub is a lot of times. I'm going to deny that the Bible is that book because I don't want it to have to tell me this, right? I don't like what it says here, so I'm going to deny it at this point. And so that's a that's a difficult position, but what we need to be able to do is present the case that the Bible is what it claims to be. Um, and it actually is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Um, so the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, you know? Um, I mean, that's a pretty good descriptor. I'd like to be that. Thoroughly equipped for every good work and complete. I mean, who doesn't want that, right? I mean, how many books that are, are on you know the bestseller list? I mean, I have a goal of how many books I want to read in a year and stuff. And I'm, I mean, I'm an Audible Platinum member, and I'm always <coughs> listening to books and, and stuff like that. And almost all of them are you know, nonfiction books that, you know, designed to help you in one aspect of life or another, right? But, I mean... Why are there so many? Why are there all these all these different ones? And they go on the bestseller list for a little bit, and then they go off. Well, the Bible they don't even keep on the bestseller list because it is always the number one bestseller. It's called the perennial bestseller. And I think somebody actually talked about that a, a couple months ago on a Wednesday night or something like that. Kyle Butt said that. That's right. Kyle Butt was talking about that. Um, I was reading that again recently, but talking about how the Bible is called a perennial bestseller it means every single year it is the best-selling book in the entire world. So. You're going to be like, we're just going to put an asterisk on it and put it at the very bottom. Yeah, yeah, the Bible, right? And then all these other books are the are the number one, number two best-selling books, you know? Because people still are reading the Bible and still find value in it thousands of years later. Uh, what thoughts or comments do we have as we close? It's amazing to see the desire for the Bible. I just got a request from... Uh... South, from, from, uh, South Africa mm -hmm. for a shipping container full of Bibles translated into Swahili. Yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're wanting a shipping container packed full. So there's the desire and there's the need for it. It's amazing that there's the love for the Bible. Like mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Well, next week we'll get into inspiration. And um, thank you very much. <laughs>